I think I'm all set up. Okay. Uh, hey there, I'm Dan Finlay. I'm from MetaMask, and uh, I'm also building on Agoric's secure ECMAScript work. And uh, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of, you know, Mark comes with a lot of proposals to TC39, and so I'm, I'm really happy to have some members uh, from there here because I'm hoping to bring a little practicality, like how, how it affects us uh, every day. And we've got a pretty, um, pretty unique use case that puts us in a position of caring a lot about a couple of the features that this, this has. So, um, so MetaMask, uh, just to, oh, so I'll introduce myself. I'm, I'm a co-founder of MetaMask. I, I worked at Apple. I've been doing JavaScript for like seven years. And I've been focusing largely on MetaMask's extensibility, but I'll be talking about two things we've been doing. What is MetaMask? You're like, what the heck is that? Um, when the Ethereum blockchain came out, it was the first blockchain that could run applications. And that piqued my interest and my co-founder Aaron's interest. We were like, oh wait, you could write a, a software that doesn't have anyone who could subvert it. So you could make, you could make a, a cooperative where the voting process is enforced, or you could make a new community currency. Or, you know, there, you know our, our imaginations went wild. And we tried making an app, and we realized that the, the fundamentals of logging into a web app are totally broken by blockchains. Um, because blockchains, there is no registry of accounts. There are no secrets. There's just your cryptographic keys that control your accounts. So we needed to make an account manager that was client side. It was going to store your secrets, and it was going to protect those secrets from all the hazardous, ha all the hazards of the world you interact with. In in my version of JavaScript, there is no safe code, right? You're you're going, you're bringing your money. You've got people put way too much money into this, right? People are putting. <laughs> I don't want to tell you how much money I've seen people uh, put into it, but you know they do, and people will put sometimes you know maybe they put in, maybe they got a million dollars, let's say, in their wallet, in their web browser, in, in JavaScript, and and they're uh, and we've got uh, uh, over a million users, and we've got a lot of application developers, and uh, a lot of people started crowd sales and started funding projects, and there was a, a lot of excitement and enthusiasm, and really we we saw things really go wild in 2017. Uh, and you know things have been maturing a little bit. We've had a couple years of incubation. People saying, "Okay, we know we can crowdfund really rapidly, but can we do it well? Can we do it carefully? Can we do it sanely?" Um, so, so today, what we are is we're basically the we're kind of the initial, the first kind of dominant uh, account manager for blockchain applications. Um, so, it, from a technical perspective, right now it's a web extension and a mobile browser. Uh, we provide key recovery and storage. We, we provide an API to websites. We add an API to the browser. And we let you just generate accounts like they were candy. So you can just, you, it's fully pseudonymous. And we add these payment APIs. Um, and you can interact with these new applications. Um, but there are a lot of unique challenges to this space. Um, we simultaneously have the highest security. We've got the security of a bank. But we've got just the usability of no one's ever thought about this stuff before. And meanwhile, the technology is so immature that we actually are constantly under pressure to innovate. So, so we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. We need to innovate. We need to explore new protocols. You may hear a lot. People say blockchains don't scale. You know, will it ever take off? Or maybe Facebook's just going to you know, squash it all, and we're all just going to be, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we're going to use a lot of Facebooks. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, I mean, maybe. Uh, but, uh, but can these things scale? And if we're going to make them scale, we need, to, we need to iterate, and we need to innovate. So can we, can we provide usability? Can we experiment with extensibility and still maintain that security that reckless people are going to throw into our code? So in short, we've got a lot of features we want to add, but we have to preserve uh, our security. So we actually have two. This inspired, when we learned about Agoric's work, it inspired two major projects uh, within our organization. Um, one is called Lava Moat, and the other ones we're, we're calling Snaps. So first, I'll talk about Lava Moat. And it has implications for the entire, I think, JavaScript ecosystem. Um, what, what Lava Moat is, is uh, basically it's, it's a solution to the, the NPM uh, ecosystem security problem. Um, there was this great article back in uh, 2018. You might have read it. It was a wonderful satire, but it was like a little too realistic and plausible. It's basically described an attack. It was just like, yeah, I, I wrote a uh, log uh, color formatter. And, and now I'm just reaping uh, tons of credit cards. And you know I just, I just steal every one out of 100 accounts no one notices. Ha, ha, ha. And it's so plausible. And, and, and you know, OK, but maybe it's sci-fi. We don't know. But you know, then the next uh, year, um, a major a Bitcoin wallet got hacked in the exact way described in that article. Um, in this case, there was a simple, a very small module, just a, a stream transform, 
of the event stream transform. And the maintainer, you know, he wrote it as an experiment. He's a, he's a, you know, a code wizard. He, he's making all sorts of interesting modules, and people depend, mil millions and millions of people depend on his modules every day. And he wasn't maintaining this one anymore. And some, when some intrepid contributor said, oh, hey, uh, I found some bugs. I'm enhancing the documentation. He gave them contributor rights. Why wouldn't he? Because this is a project he didn't care about anymore. Well, what that contributor knew is that this little tiny stream module was being used in the BitPay Bitcoin wallet. And so they were able to undermine the build process of that Bitcoin wallet and add. So, so it, didn't, it didn't even look like there was a problem. But when you built it, now it injects a thing so, so that now when, when their keys go through a stream, uh, it sends them up to their home base. And they, they sold, uh, I think it was around $12 million that way. Um, so you know, we're, we're, a, we're a JavaScript. Uh, we're a JavaScript wallet. What do, we, what do we do about that? So we've got Lava Mode. Uh, ignore this, this thing on the side for a sec. Um, it is a JavaScript build transform. So first, it's Browserify. It's going to be Webpack. It's actually very trivial to work between different build processes. And it puts every single dependency into a test container. The same thing you saw running uh, around that light bulb. We put every dependency in it. Like, we just don't trust it at all. And then we, so they get no global API. They get no permissions by default. And all of those permissions that they do get are constrained by a config file that we generate the first time we install it. So, uh, so here's a hypothetical stream HTTP. You know, we've got plenty of stream transform modules in our uh, dependency graph. In this case, it uses a number of globals. Um, and you can see, actually, it does use uh, XML HTTP requests, which is one of those in fetch. So we, we watch those ones real close. So this, this would be a sensitive module that we might audit more closely. But, but the average module, if it's just transforming a stream, we would give it none of those things. It may be a pure function, input and out. And we now can trust much more safely that that, that dependency uh, isn't the thing that's going to be stealing our keys. As long as we're running this transform, uh, at, we're, we're not running scripts at install time in our build process and at runtime. So those are like the three points. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, we can rebuild that config pot file whenever the dependencies change. And so we'll get a diff. So if we suddenly were subject to that exact same hack, we would have a bot that runs a diff. And we'd see a little red line or, or a little green line that says, oh, suddenly you know, event stream wants network access. And we'd, we'd scratch our heads. And we might read the source code and say, like, what is that very long obfuscated line? And so it's a cool. Uh, static analysis tool as well as a sandboxing tool or confinement tool. And uh, yeah, so we get that visible diff. Um, so here is, here's a picture of our dependency graph run through that transform. Green modules are modules that where we removed so much authority from them that we're really not that concerned anymore. They don't have network access. They don't have disk. Um, and they're not connected to very sensitive modules. And then uh, the red and orange are ones where those, those ones needed uh, access to more sensitive things. We, we can't guarantee that those aren't going to call home, but now we've limited the, the critical attack surface to these select modules, and so now we can investigate those. And, and uh, you know, for ev any one of them now, the, uh, you know, a green module, if they would want to hack us, they would have to, uh, they'd have to both subvert the dependency tree and have a zero day on the CES uh, containment. Just, just for people who can't quite see, those are actually all connected with lines. You just can't quite see all Oh, them. yeah. If you can't tell, that's, that is a big, uh, a big graph. And this is, a, yeah, it's a lot of dependencies. But um, welcome to JavaScript, OK? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean you, you may trust your origin, but uh, that's probably because you're not using NPM. All right. Um, and, then, and now here is here's our same uh, dependency graph running not under CES, right? Naturally, if it has all, if they all, if we don't have secure ECMAScript, if we don't have that containment, then any single one of these modules could uh, pollute our array prototype push. It could uh, you know, phone home. And there's just a million ways that they could just steal everything. So, so we just massively reduce that. OK. That, that's one of the ways that we found useful, too. Uh, so that was the security one. And a lot of people don't get inspired by the security story. They say, no, no, we really can secure our code. And that's fine. If that's, if that's for you, uh, so be it. But there's another very interesting story we found using Secure ECMAScript. Um, because we also are constantly being pressed to innovate. Uh, cryptocurrency is moving incredibly fast. We are an Ethereum-first wallet. But there's uh, like 100 blockchains right now. And, and there's uh, you know, 1,000 scaling strategies. And every single one of them comes to our repo. And they say, they say accept our pull request. Integrate us. Give us first-class status. You know, show all your users. 
and it's, it's a lot of pressure, and we, we have to audit this code, and we have to say, and, and now we, we feel like we're uh, picking winners. We can't read all the white papers. How do, we, how do we keep ourselves relevant in a space where we're trying to facilitate creativity that is just booming, right? It, this is, it, people are saying this has the p potential to rewrite uh, the rules of finance and how society works, and if that's the case, then, well, yeah, then all that funding is justified, but how do those people get in the door? Today, each one of them has to write a whole wallet from scratch. So our users, they could come to us, they, they want new networks, uh, new features, scaling strategies, contract accounts, um, uh, new hosting services, hardware wallets, cryptography, et cetera, like I was saying. Um, and we're, we just can't merge enough. So, so what do we do? We start constraining contributions. Um, so we, we've written a, a little bit of a permissions system. So at, we added to the API that we provide to sites, we, we gave a, a way of requesting permissions um, from our wallet. But the, the most interesting permission we added was the permission to run a script, which itself gets permissions. So uh, this means we, we get to have a nice, pretty little prompt when somebody's logging in with our, with our system. Um, and they, uh, yeah, what is it? Uh, yeah, so we already get uh, permissions. And now we have the ability to get user consent to further delegate those uh, permissions. So, uh, so we're, you know, we're confined as a web extension, but now we can further confine uh, things that we want. So through delegation, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, we can then extend further, and we can and we can now extend APIs that are very specific to what a new cryptocurrency wallet needs. So we're we're pretty sure that a new cryptocurrency actually only needs a couple things from us. We've we've done all the groundwork, right? We've we've got the user backing up keys. We've we've added an API to the website. They basically need. Oh, actually, the next slide shows it. Um, about a month ago, we did a hackathon with the Goric. They mentioned they're doing a blockchain. As our hackathon project, we used this plugin system to, at runtime, sign into a site where uh, we added their blockchain support as part of the login flow. So we believe this is the first time that someone added uh, blockchain support to a wallet at runtime. So it's very similar to our normal login. Basically, they're like, uh, when you're logging, we think we can make this one permission request. But basically, they want to know if you can uh, install the script. And then the script wants, and this is the important part, um, it's got two little permissions it's asking for. Permission to display confirmations for user action and display custom assets in your wallet. And so those are the two, when we talk about attenuating, what are the, what are the functions you're passing to this untrusted script? Uh, to us, support for another blockchain, uh, there would also be network support there. A, a new blockchain interacting with your, with your wallet, uh, with your browser, basically needs network access. They just want to list an asset and they want to ask user consent. So those three things, now we make three functions for that. We've very greatly confined it, and now we have a scalable, uh, kind of permissionless blockchain playground. And, uh, and our uh, developer community is seriously going nuts about it because previously every new blockchain needed to write their own new wallet, their own new account manager, all this stuff. Suddenly they just have to write a little script that just describes how to interact with it, and now they can go wild, they can build applications. So uh, we're seeing uh, people starting to build new uh, networks and scalability. Uh, there's, you, you can write smart contract accounts, which means like you don't have to ask somebody else to two-factor or to authenticate. You can like have a social network recovery, or uh, we saw a smart will. There's some some cool things like that. Um, new new kinds of privacy. We're yeah uh, yeah end-to-end -end encryption in the browser. Um, uh, yeah, new security enhancements. Blah blah blah. Uh, yeah, we we have a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, our developers have been like rebirthed with uh, excitement. Um, this is like a part of our platform that was closed before, blocked by PRs. If you know what it's like maintaining a very contentious uh, GitHub repository, uh, then you might be able to appreciate what it's like when you can finally tell people, like, actually, if you can get users to consent to a couple simple permissions, like, it's, it's their web now. Like, they can literally add APIs to their browser at runtime uh, with this. So it's like got implications a little bit beyond cryptocurrency, too. Um, so I'll just end with a Mark Miller quote. You know, this has been driving his work for a long time now. If you reduce the risk of cooperation, you get a more cooperative world. Um, this, is, this is all about software getting fun again, right? Uh, we, fun, but without losing that, the gravity of, of what we're working with. Um, so, you know, we don't know that any of this, this is perfect, you know, but we would like it to be. We understand the, the principles that make this exciting to us. And that's why we are here, uh, TC39, basically saying, like, facilitate standards that make it safer to secure and isolate uh, JavaScript. And uh, a lot of times that it does mean kind of <laughs> listen to, you know, I'm not saying unquestioningly, but uh, if you understand these principles, you understand a lot of the kind of guiding, uh, you know, uh, thrusts to their ideas. 
And uh, yeah, realms, containers, um, out of memory must fail, uh, <laughs> virtualization, all that. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for hearing me out. Uh, <laughs> Oh yeah, and we're gonna have bug bounties and stuff. So like, if you're if you're a security researcher or something, obviously we have a lot at stake here. And so uh, yeah, yeah, come come down, help us find bugs, and we, we can pay you. Uh, questions. Yeah, questions. Any questions? Yeah. How big is your developer community? And repeat the question. Whew, how big is our developer community? Um, we lost track a, a long time ago. You know, in 2017, I, I could tell you uh, how how many developers there are. Um, I, I think weekly actives, which are honestly mostly developers, it's around 45,000. Uh, so maybe we'll say like 20,000. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it's a, and yeah, we've seen a lot of renewed interest. You know, people got kind of, it was feeling a little bit stuck, you know, if you're, because people knew Ethereum wasn't scaling yet, you know, we're waiting for Ethereum too. But when we suddenly say, well, how about all of those alternative token protocols and all those other ideas you had? when we give them away. And so, yeah, I, I think it, this is going to be an exciting year for, for them and hopefully others. Yeah. How do you figure out which APIs are used by which? Yeah, so that's, uh, uh, how do we figure out during in the lava moat build process, how do we know what APIs are used by each package? So it is a static analysis, right? So it's obviously not perfect. But here's the good news is because we're only permitting uh, access to things that we explicitly list in that config, if some module was being sneaky and obfuscating the things it was using, it would, it would fail by not gaining access to that thing. Um, so so it, that config file, it, uh, yeah, it restricts and only allows access to the things explicitly listed. And so we make our best guess. So far, it's been good. We've gotten most of our dependencies uh, in it. You know, we're, we're, it's in progress right now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. Uh, no, right now, uh, are we using the XS engine or are we using V8 or something? Right now, both of those are in beta. So neither of those are in production right now. And so we are using the Realms shim. And, you know, there, there were vulnerabilities found uh, in, in the last few months, right? So we know that uh, a JavaScript-based containment is not the perfect solution. Uh, that's why it's critical that this gets adopted by, by the runtimes themselves, because you can't be like a native enforcement of these policies. Um, can I inject something? Yeah, yeah. Just, j just for clarity, the Realm shim is pre-production, right. you know, and it's going through security reviews and the up to distant future and that sort of thing. Right, right. So it, it will improve. Right. It's, this is this is a way of experimenting with what could be, and and it is it's JavaScript, and and if we do it right, it will be secure, and it's so much more fun to play in a secure language where you can just like link your code together and have very very explicit guarantees about what the other can do. It makes it makes the cooperation much cheaper. Uh, yeah. Any others? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty simple. Thanks.